I'm pleased to uh, welcome today Sai Safi, who is here to share with us his introduction to the Living Building Challenge 3.0, a visionary path to a future that gives back to our planet. Let's welcome him. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, I guess just a little, a little bit about myself. I've, I've just to let you know who I am and, and what I've done and kind of where I've arrived here with the Living Building Challenge to present it is what I'm doing is I, I am volunteering for the International Living Future Institute and um, I'm presenting the Living Building Challenge because this is the most rigorous um, green building or green design program out there. And it doesn't only think about just homes, buildings, uh, it also thinks about infrastructure, it thinks about landscapes, it thinks about everything that we don't always think about or the things that always affect or interact with us in our lives. Um, I grew up in construction, so I've been exposed to a lot of great projects. I've worked in them. My father was a civil engineer and a builder, so my brothers and I used to work for him. We used to carry lumber and, and be his right-hand man. And we were carpenters, we were electricians, we were plumbers. We did all of that, and I absolutely loved it. My dad was a hero. and and uh, I wanted to also learn more. I wanted to, to, to expand my horizons. And my, our father always used to tell us, don't ever be satisfied with the status quo. You, you, you know, and I remember asking him as a kid, we're in our, our cousin's basement, and it was musty. And I said, Dad, why does it smell like this? And I didn't want to be rude, I didn't want anybody to hear me. And he built that house uh, probably 40 years ago. It was one of his first houses he built. And uh, he said, well, unfortunately, son, there's not enough really good products out there to stop keep the outside in, uh, outside and, and have a good environment for and solutions for a basement. But he said, it's up to you. He said, you need to be able to come up with ideas. You need to be able to be innovative. You can't be, you can't be content with what's out there. And you want to always improve and make, help our industry get better. So this is an area of improvement. Um, so we will, I always kept that in my mind and I was always wanting to learn more. And I, and, and I'd go, I, I go out of town probably once a month to conferences and, and I'm always trying to learn. I'm always just taking it all in because there's, there's not just one solution to being able to solve a lot of our issues that we deal with these days. Um, so uh, a house that we did, we did a house recently with LEED standards. It was net zero energy usage and also net zero water. So we collect all our water and that's not enough. If you ask me, and we won an international award for it. Uh, they flew us to Germany. It was wonderful. It was great, but to me, that's still not enough. And the Living Building Challenge, it, it's uh, it's not a building per se. It's what you build. We build all kinds of things every day. It could be a bird's nest, like we saw upstairs. It could be a paper machete. It could be anything. It could be art. Um, but how we approach that is the whole thing. It's it's about a philosophy. It's about taking into consideration everything. What are, we, um, what are we doing when we make a decision to purchase this, purchase this product? Who are we affecting? And who are we supporting? And, and then at the same time, you know, is this going to be durable? Is it going to last? How much maintenance is there going to be? And what effect are we having on the planet? So um, we'll hit on all that. But what we live in now is, is challenging because we're disconnected from the outside. There's no real good design out there. There is some out there, but most of what we see for houses, it's not really well designed by designers. Sometimes people just kind of get a plan that might be out there or they pick something that's copied by production. <coughs> but what we've done is we've disconnected ourselves from nature. And what we want to do is learn from nature because nature is resilient. These days, sustainability is not the word that we should all be talking about only. Sustainability certainly is the word, it's an important word, but we should really not be thinking further than that. Resilience and regenerative. Being regenerative and being resilient. So nature's resilient. Leaves fall, trees fall, boom, they come back. Same thing with grass, you cut it, it comes back. We can't find nature. Water will go where it needs to go. It replenishes, it gives life. So nature's resilient, it comes back. So the homes and the homes that we want to consider and do and build and support are ones that actually take care of themselves. And they actually don't only just take from the earth, they give back to the earth and they give back to us. So going into the living building challenge, 
So this is an ambassador. I'm an ambassador presenter for the International Living Future Institute. It started out west in um, uh, Oregon, Portland, Oregon, and they also have a, an office in Seattle, Washington. Um, these learning objectives are you know, kind of based on you know, the petals, and we're going to talk about the, the metaphor of the flower because there are green building certification programs out there. There's LEED, uh, and LEED, Leadership in Energy Environmental Design, it, it hits on all the important areas we need to consider. We need to consider energy efficiency, water efficiency, um, indoor air quality, we don't always think about. A lot of times our indoor air is two to ten times worse than outside air, and that's an EPA study. It has a lot to do with flawed design. Um, but what we are trying to do with the Living Building Challenge is, is use that flower as a metaphor. Uh, and the flower, it's going back to nature. The flower is it's rooted in place, so it, it, it's there where it's at. But it's in its, it lives and it harvests all of its energy and water from the sun and what's out there. And it also is adapted to its climate and the site it's on. So it flourishes and it, and it operates pollution free. And obviously it's comprised of integrated systems around it and the ecosystem it is. And it's also beautiful. Do we think about these things? So the challenge, and this challenge is, it's a challenge, it's not a joke, it's not, it's the most rigorous program out there. There's only 200 plus, probably close to 300 projects out there worldwide that are doing this. And this challenge is a challenge because we're trying to change the industry, move it forward to where it needs to be. You know, the car has gone from 1890, I believe, when Ford started that first Model T, and now we're at where we're at now. We're already at Tesla. So the home building industry has really lagged behind. So what we're trying to do is get home building and, and commercial building up to speed with the way things really should be done now and consider science and building science in this. And when you, we were also, we'll get into is something called biophilia. And biophilia is love of living things. But then you have biomimicry, which is learning from nature. So you want to mimic nature's natural ways and use nature as a proven process that works and implement it in architecture or engineering or everything we do. For example, Southwest uh, used the way the ants move out through colonies to pack their planes. And apparently, that works very well. Um, so there's three typologies. You could do it on renovation. So you could do it on existing homes, and you could do it on buildings, uh, commercial. You can do it on landscapes and infrastructures, the Living Building Challenge. And currently, there's one that uh, uh, Bernheim had done in Louisville. They did an edible garden. I don't know if you guys have seen it yet, but they did it with the Living Building Challenge. Um, so going off of the flower, the petals. So you, you want to consider with, the, with, with each category that we design with and we consider when making a home is the place. Where is it at? Water, energy, health, happiness, materials, equity, and beauty. Usually we usually see water and energy or you know water conservation, energy, and then maybe source and materials, but do we really think about beauty? How do you gauge beauty? I mean, that is a factor. Think about beauty for a second. Um, if there's a house or a building that's run down, just completely in shambles, people will look at it and say, oh, just tear that down, it's so ugly, get rid of it. But what if it had this beautiful facade on the front? Beautiful architectural features. What do people say? Let's keep that, let's preserve it. So beauty is valued by, by us naturally. And to be able to say, cut beauty out of it just because you want to save a couple dollars, you're also basically cutting that inspiration you get from beauty and that comfort and that satisfaction we get from beauty, like nature. So in more detail, some of these items, when you, when you talk about place, we're talking about limits to growth, urban agriculture, habitat exchange, human-powered living. So, like what's human power living, for example? Between 1940s and 1970s, cities pretty much adopted the, they, they actually catered design of cities just to cater to the automobile. So, we've basically had engineers <laughs> take a, a whole city and make it just for the automobile. And what happens, what happens to the pedestrian experience? People get on bikes, get hit by cars all the time. My brother got hit in college 
my, my other brother and I were laughing because we thought it was funny, but <laughs> it wasn't nice. It wasn't nice. But <laughs> when he told the story, it was really funny. <laughs> and he was okay. But, um, you know, pedestrian kids get hit by cars, unfortunately, all the time. And, and, and then just to be auto-dependent. You know, when you're, when you're designing cities just to be catered to the automobile, now you've got to use the automobile to go get a, a, a glass of water or coffee or something. So you want to have uh, communities in place that are actually pedestrian friendly, designed for the people, and also considering children, designed for children. Um, net positive water is very uh, it's aggressive, but that's what we're talking about. We're talking about being completely independent of, of any sources and being hooked up to any sources. And we can do these, and there are examples of this being done. It's been done for many years. It's kind of going back to simplicity. Then net positive energy. Um, when you talk about, um, I forgot the heading on that one, health and happiness, yeah. So civilized environment and a healthy interior environment, biophilic environment, biophilia. Again, for many, many years, human beings have, have this, this programming in us that we love living things, nature. So when we create these homes that have small windows, barely lets any natural light in, you know, or, or allows us to see the outside, we're closing ourselves off to what we naturally should have around us. Nature inspires. And nature is what actually, it, it, it's, there's, there's studies out there that, uh, there's quite a few of them that show how nature affects our psyche and our happiness and our well-being. So we want to be able to bring the nature back into the, we, we want to create kind of an indoor-outdoor feel while you're inside. And, when we talk about materials, we've created a red list. These are materials that we should never have in a building or a home. And right now I can almost guarantee that if these materials that we're exposed to right now are not vetted, then I can almost guarantee they're toxic. And they're off-gassing. We may not smell it, but we're breathing it. And if you think about the new car smell or the new home smell, goodness. <laughs> you are just bringing in toxins in your body that will kill you. And people that have multiple ke chemical sensitivity can tell and see that and feel that. Because uh, the last house we did, we were sure to, to make sure we had <laughs> zero VOCs in it. And there were some because uh, we couldn't avoid it. And when, it, when we had someone walk in, actually our carpet person that supplied our carpet, her name is Jennifer Carpet Corner over here in Indiana. She, she said, Cy, when you had your media day, I totally did not want to come because... I, I um, anytime a, a homeowner calls me and tells me to come in their new home to measure, I just dread it because when I go in there, all those chemicals and smells just make me choke up that I have to make an excuse to go out to my car within 10 minutes to go gasp for air because those chemicals affect her so bad. When she came into our house, when we had media day, um, when we opened up this My Green Kentucky Home, we called it, um, I, I'm talking to somebody, I see her just running around, and I'm like, man, Jennifer looks excited. That's great. I'm glad she looks happy. So after I get done, she comes up to me. She's like, Sai, oh my gosh, Sai, I cannot believe this. I'm, I'm like thinking, oh gosh, what's going on here? She said, I've been here for 15 minutes and I have not had one allergic breakout at all. I cannot believe this. And I said, wow, that's amazing. She gave me goosebumps. She really did. Because it, when we made those decisions up front going in here before we sourced and purchased our materials, we made a conscientious decision not to expose people to toxins. And it really worked. Same thing with our camera guy that was filming the process. You know, he was able to walk around. He said he breathed better inside the house than he did outside because of his allergies. And those are the systems we put in place. Doing human scale, humane places, and having universal access to nature and to uh, a place where you're at. So not only can the people that have all the money or the 1% that has 50% of the money in the world only have those beautiful spots of this earth and, and have it just for themselves. We want people to, that can't always have that or not afford that to also be able to have access to nature in beautiful places. So we want it to be equitable. And then just organizations, we want to be able to support organizations that treat their employees well. That, you know, you want to also be able to source locally. But where are you, where are they sourcing their raw products from? Are they going to Brazil and kicking people out of their, their homes and blasting the sides of, of mountains just to get your beautiful granite countertop. 
or onyx or whatever you might be getting out of the earth? How's that just for the people that's living there? How's that just for the, the, the living organisms and systems that are living around it, the ecosystems that keep our world running? How's that just for that as well? It's not, but we have to consider that. So everybody in this room has a vote with their dollar on what they decide to purchase or put into their home. So when we support better practices and we support companies and, and businesses and, and organizations that support just practices, we're telling people what, that this is what we want. We want somebody that's treating people fairly. Um, and then again, the beauty and, and spirit and beauty will inspire play. It, you know, good design gives you a wow factor. It gives you a connection to the outside. You get natural light in. You feel inspired. You, you have a much better attitude. Right now the sun is out and I've, I got more energy with the sun out. I mean, we've already developed enough of this earth. Enough of this earth that can take care of us. To go out there and just mess with natural habitat, there's no reason to. It needs to be there, we need to preserve it. And in our, our rural areas in agriculture, you know, I have, a, I have an issue with just developing and, and taking, getting rid of farms just to put homes there. You know, those farms are there for a purpose and they're there to, to feed us. So when we go there, we, we just tear out and the trees and, and agriculture and just plop a subdivision down that's dependent on utilities and just is energy hogs and you know that's completely backwards approach to to any development so we want to leave areas for that leave areas then you have zones for for village or campus type zones then you have general business general urban zones and urban centered zones where it's more uh, pedestrian friendly and you have the urban cores so these these are areas that um, good design takes in consideration that you, you have to have certain areas for certain things, but we have a lot of already out there infrastructure that's already made and it's already in place that we should go back and now fix what's already run down instead of just tearing up new stuff and getting rid of ecosystems and, and destroying places of life for natural living. So there's a thing called scale jumping in this program and scale jumping is basically taking like for example this is a multi-family they have one roof so this one roof collects all the water and, and, it, and it basically service, serves all the units and you could do it kind of in this village this village has multiple homes near each other but they're all sourcing their energy from a community um, a community solar system and there's also rainwater catchment on this building this building might get enough for their offices but they're going to share it with their neighbor who could be these folks here so you want to be able to use what you have to take advantage of nature. It's free, and and we should be doing that first and foremost. Um, so if you're, if say for example you are certifying your home per living building challenge, then there are different ways of doing it. There's a full certification where you're doing all pedals per se, and you're doing all imperatives that come along with it, and then you can do just a pedal certification. If you don't want to do all those pedals of happiness and beauty and and materials, then you can pick three and go to that. Or you can do a true net zero energy um, um, certification for your home, where you're really net zero, where you're producing all of your energy and you're producing actually more. You want to, where our goal is really to be net positive, producing more than 100%. They say 100% at least to get what you're using. Uh, what's, what's neat about this, and Nancy Church, she's here in the audience, she's our executive director for the Green Building Council. She asked me, she's been asking me for a year to lead a group called Greening the MLS and um, and now I did accept it so I'm going to help green the MLS and we're starting in Louisville and that's basically being able to recognize and put true value to homes that have better value to them. What's MLS? Um, multiple listing service for the realtors uh, right now, they go in there and they, if they list a house, they're going to click these boxes that are all there, and there's nothing there that says this house is, say, Energy Star approved. Like in Kentucky, there's about 11,500 Energy Star homes that are certified, and there's quite a few lead homes now that are coming up and because of Fort Knox and, and some private, um, but we want true value to be given to these homes because they've been given the proper uh, proper attention and proper uh, diligence in design and approach to it. So we want that to be valued because there's more value in that. They're more comfortable, they save us money, they, they're more durable, they're less maintenance, they're, they're just 
all around a better product. And it's everything we're looking for because when I was thinking of, I started my company in 06, I was doing commercial construction and I grew up in residential and did commercial, but um, I was doing it for private sector and a lot of the owners that I was working for were nonprofits and they didn't necessarily have much commercial construction experience. But so I'm explaining to them, okay, we have to do this or that. And they would say, oh, I don't really understand that. But when I did my home, when I built my home or I had an addition done, so everything went back to a home for them. And then they would complain about the problems that they have, a cold basement, a, you know, drafty walls, um, high energy bills, what have you. And then they would talk bad about residential construction, which then reflected on me because I'm in the industry and, and I didn't like that because I know that there are diligent people out there that know what the heck they're doing. So that's where I came up with the Migrant Kentucky Home Model, and that's why I want to put something out there that took care of all of these issues that we're all concerned about in the home. And, 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 it, and it's all encompassing programs out there that do that. And that's why I really advocate for going for a certification, because your value will come. Right now in California, they're recognizing it. And they're in homes that are, that are certified are appraising at least 10% on average higher. Yes, and it's and it's awesome. Things are coming this way, you know, and, and, and it's interesting. I like to, I hate using this, but Mark Twain said it. He said that if the world were to end today, I'd move to Kentucky because they're 20 years behind. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> unfortunately, there's truth behind it. Why are we having a hard time adopting best practices? You know, it, it, it's like these best practices pay us back. Our homes are typically taking from us. They're taking from us. Here, here you go. Here's my car. Here's my bill. You know, and and then here's here's for repairs. It's always taken from us. Why doesn't it just give back to us? This house we did is going to give the owner. We're only step foot in there. It's almost a four. Excuse me, almost a four thousand square foot home. Three, four bedroom, three bath. Yeah, it's probably a little bigger than what they need, but. Um, trust me, that that's not as big as the one I did in Texas. That's like close to 8,500 square feet, ten bathrooms, guest house. But but I'd rather somebody come to me that wants that done because I'm going to do it right for them. And the house that I, that that house is telling you about the almost 4,000 square foot house, they're only paying for connection fees for LGD. So they're only paying 29 bucks a month. So we compared it to neighbors that have the same type of footprint, same type of square footage. They're saving 300, 350 a month. In 10 years, mm -hmm. you know, they're going to save over $50,000. Mm -hmm. So okay, maybe best practices might cost you another 10%, 12% if you are adding a bunch of features to your home. You get it back in less than five years. Now you're making money and, and in 30 years you've got your home paid off. <laughs> it's like a kind of like a reverse mortgage, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it just makes sense. Sorry, with a house in Texas, hundred dollar energy bill a month. His neighbors, fifteen hundred a month. So he's saving fourteen hundred a month, and that's pretty ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. Over here, so these are some projects, and this is just as of May of '04, but these are projects that is catching on with the Living Building Challenge, and. There's a lot in the U.S. and there's a lot in other places of the world, which is pretty awesome. And actually, there's probably another hundred more that are on here. In some of these places it's at, it's in Canada, U.S., it's in China, India, Mexico, Haiti, Lebanon, France, Romania, Australia, New Zealand. So it's happening everywhere. And landscaping is huge. Um, you know, we go in there in, into any natural setting, we tear it all up and we plop our house there. And do we really consider what we just did to the animals and nature and the ecosystems that have lived there. We have to be able to kind of restore what we just did. So when we're picking landscapes, we don't want to go with a Japanese maple, because that's from Japan, apparently. We want to go, <laughs> we want to basically try to emulate, you know, the, the, the functionality of the indigenous ecosystems around. We want to basically restore what we damaged. So we want to put back in place what, what's naturally from there. When he puts what's naturally from the place that we're at here in, in southern Indiana and in Louisville, we are putting wildlife that uses those plants that we put back. We're, we're, we're bringing back those ecosystems. And we're also putting a landscape in that supports life around it. So we're putting in landscape that doesn't require that much watering. So it's drought resistant, basically. And it's non-invasive, so it doesn't take over other plants. 
and you don't have, you know, and you're able to then have something that's a lot less maintenance, and it stays beautiful. So trying to find those native land plants and topsoil and, and just restoring it. This is an interesting thing about urban agri agriculture. So you, you, you want, we all want a beautiful place to live, um, but there's also a function that we should think of, it's called the floor area ratio. So however much floor area you have to however much land you have available, you want to be able to be just with that land and not be hoarding it, for example, or just using, having grass all over it, because grass is one of the worst things that we can have, quite frankly. Why? Because it requires to be watered, it requires fertilizer, it requires cutting it with lawnmowers that have, that output 70, 70 times more carbon than a, than a vehicle with, with a catalytic converter. So we're doing more and more harm with just having a, a lawn with grass. When you can go back and you can make something like this and not have to really maintain it, and that could be something beautiful like a sanctuary. But if you have, for example, um, you know, a higher, higher amount of land, large amount of land, then you want to use 80% of it for, uh, for growing crops on it, for, to be able to have food for your family and also be able to give it to the community or allow community to use it for shared uses. There's a lot of people that in, in urban areas or dense populated areas that don't have access to food, good, fresh, clean food. And that's why they call them, um, you know, uh, someone help me with this, deserts. Uh, food, deserts. food deserts, thank you. Economical challenge. And there is a, a, a strong movement now for urban agriculture on these vacant lots, which is excellent. That's awesome. Um, so we want to be able to use our land for good uses whether that's to donate or even sell it. So Habitat Exchange is just giving back to taking a very, very small percentage of, uh, of your project that you do if you're building a home and giving back to um, approved Habitat Exchanges either through Living Future Institute or through an approved land trust organization that they're there trying to restore and, and keep and, and, and help our habitat live from all the destruction we've been doing. Right now, obviously, our area, we have, we have a good amount of water here, but when I go out west, they have a major issue out there. Colorado River, the groundwater table, it's, it's, a, it's a major, it, it's, a, it's a problem. You know, they, they have droughts. Last time San Francisco had a rain was probably, I think, three months ago. From, again, we, we, wanna, we, wanna be able, we wanna be able to allow this home to live and work for us, not us work for it to keep it going. We can collect all of our water on our roofs, and we can store it. So the house that we did, we, we were able to collect 100% of the water off the roof, and then and, and it goes through a couple washer boxes on the side where the downspouts are, where it just filters out any large particulates, leaves, whatever. It goes down into the cistern that I made under the porch, and it was kind of funny because as a kid growing up in, North, in Union, Kentucky, um, there were a lot of people lived out in rural areas, so they always had a cistern in their front porch because that's where the water truck would pull up and pour water in their cistern and that's where they pulled their water from. So I always had this idea of, hey, a good use for the bottom of a porch is a cistern. So we designed a cistern, which is really cool. We get 3,300 gallons of water. The average person in a house that doesn't have water uh, efficient fixtures uses 80 to 100 gallons a day. And if you have water efficient water, uh, fixtures, you're using 40 to 50 gallons a day. And so 3,300 gallons will last the family for a while, especially with the water we have coming here. Now, we don't even have to be hooked up to the water utility if we don't want to. But to truly be sustainable or resilient or regenerative, it's illegal. You can't do that. Code won't allow it. And that's what the Institute and us were trying to do, is try to create good effective change in, in, in policy to allow us to do these things. And so being net positive on water is not hard to do. And that's partially collecting your water, which people do these days, and even when you collect it, you just send a couple test tubes out to a lab, and they test it and tell you what's in it, and they tell you what kind of filters you need. And usually those filters could be a, a cold filter, a sand filter, or a fabric filter, but it filters it, and, and it's cleaner than anything you can drink. So, part of... On the water testing, wouldn't that change depend on what kind of pollutant was in the air that week? So the filters, would you need change? Um, a lot, we, that's what the laboratory would have to tell, and, and you do test um, every once in a while. I think they would give recommendations on one test and what to test for. And I mean, if there had been a spill that week, and oh. you're getting rainwater, 
It could, it could. It's a, certainly, that, but that's a good point because you, you want to be able to know and watch uh, and see what you're exposed to and infected with. You want to know what you're doing. You want to know what you're putting in your body. You want to know what you're exposing yourself to. So being conscientious about that is important and keeping those checks and balances and transparency, yeah. Um, so storm water, gray water, and black water, These all these waters are sent off to places to be treated and to be, you you know, basically we're spending energy to, to take care of it, which we shouldn't do. And to spend energy is not what we want to do. We want to be able to uh, collect it and treat it on our site, and you can do that. And there's many examples of that. Here's a case study. It's the Mega Center in Rhinebeck, New York. Um, it's a great learning center for people to check out. This is a living building approved building. This is a living machine. A living machine is nature. Nature taking care of our waste that comes out of our bodies, solids and, and liquids. And it's indoors. So with proper natural system, biomimicry, just mimicking what nature does. You're able to take care of these issues and take care of it on our own without having to pump it miles away and spend millions of dollars and pay MSD or whoever your sewer, sewer company is charges for using that water. And, and it doesn't smell. And you know, it's just using anaerobic and aerobic to, to break it down. Net positive energy, being able to um, make more energy than you use. And there are a lot of cool things come out like uh, micro grids, which I'm going to do hopefully sometime soon on the next project. A micro grid is being able to be your own little power plant in the sense where you can collect the energy in, in, off the panels in DC current and then you you use your house in DC, so basically your phone that you use every day actually charges DC, but that adapter that we hooked to the bottom of that little square, that's changing DC to AC so that it, it uses AC power. That's what we're, we're running on is AC power essentially in our homes. And when you convert that energy that you're collecting off from the sun from DC to AC, you're losing about 20%. But if you can collect it in DC and keep it in DC, then you're able to have more energy and more power, you can store it, and you can actually be off-grid 100%. So being net positive energy is very easy these days, but it's best practices in design. Best practices in design means optimizing the situ the, how your home is facing the sun. You know, bringing in natural light so you don't have to use artificial light. Being able to bring in natural heat so you can heat the place naturally and, and be able not have to use as much uh, um, heating to heat it in the winter. And also then designing your thermal envelope, seal it tight, ventilate it right, insulate it tight, or insulate it right and ventilate it right. You don't want any air leakages. You want the right amount of uh, insulation per your climate zone. So you're minimizing your loads of energy needed to be able to, uh, to, be able to then go into it needing less energy to heat and cool it. So if you do it right, you only need like 10% of what most homes need. So you're reducing your energy demand by 80 to 90%, and now you come up with a new problem, which I was talking to Ted about, and he was talking to me about, is now you need a micro load of heating and cooling to just kind of such a very small, tiny system, heat and cool. And sometimes you could just basically heat and cool your place with a hair dryer. That's a passive house. Um, so we are energy hogs in general as human beings. We are using nearly half of the energy our, our, our um, country is, is making. Just from residential, and that's our homes, and that's our buildings, the places we work and live and, um, and work and learn and all that. So that's our decision. That's basically on us. So if we do the right practices, then we're, we can reduce that to near, you know, 10% of that. And, but us being one-fifth of that use is, is basically good design practices. And transportation is that. So if we don't really depend on the car as much to go anywhere, then we can bring that down, then we can use human power and, and have better health by walking somewhere or biking somewhere and an industry. And that's just a whole other issue. <laughs> <laughs> Here's another case study. This is the, the Bullet Center in Seattle, Washington. This is an amazing feat of design and uh, collaboration, uh, collaborative processes of bringing everybody to the table, people in the community people that are educators, people that are in healthcare, people that are in 
any industry to be able to come up with a design like this to work with the architects and the engineers and the owner. But this building is, it's, it's living building certified. So it has, it's making all of its energy, it's collecting all of its water, it's treating all, of, treating all of its waste. Right now, Seattle will not allow them to use uh, their water they're collecting right now to use for drinking water because the code is not allowing that. But they're getting an exception, hopefully soon. They have the pipes there. They have a 50,000 gallon tank underneath the building to catch 50,000 gallons of water and use it for all their purposes. They have composting toilets in there. They do not smell. They work very well. They have the, this, this, this roof right here is, is all that solar is what's needed for the six stories of an office building. And when you look at it, if you're doing a code built building, this is the this is the bullet center. If you did it code built, that's the energy use intensity of 72 kilobtus per square foot per year. That's kind of how you look at its its appetite per se. Uh, for and you would need a 63,000. That's like an acre and a half of solar panel to take care of that kind of need. If you do it to code right now, if you do it to uh, which code, which one is this one? Uh, this is Seattle's code. Yes, you would need nearly an acre of solar to get down to what your energy uh, usage is. If you do it to lead platinum, and this is just basically off of checklist items, you'll need 32, uh, 28,000 square foot, which is much smaller. And that gets it down like 70%. But if you go with Living Building Challenge, which is implementing the best of lead, the best of pa passive house, the best of these programs that are out there, all you need is 14,000 square feet, and that's how big the roof is. And that gets them 100% of pl plus of energy they need. And that's what real good design is, right size design for, you know, so to make an office building just way high, it's going to depend on other things beyond that because you can't create a right size building that's 100 stories tall and allow it to be able to produce its own energy and support itself. It's going to have to rely on, on other sources. I've been to there and it's awesome, you should go. Anytime you get a chance to, you should check it out. Beautiful. I've been to this one too in Issaquah, Washington. Brad Lilquist made this. Uh, they call it Z-Home. Every condo or apartment there, they, they're net positive energy. And they, and they use that sun to power all the, all the units. So imagine not having to have an energy bill. They kind of did the scale jumping here. So what they did in this community is they they use ground sourced heat wells, heat pumps. So they're using the Earth's temperature of 55 degrees to to basically treat the refrigerant in the mechanical system, and and all these units are using that. So it's a community scale jumping, and they're all using the same loop, and and that's the geothermal unit that's inside. The beautiful thing about this too, which is really neat, they're very very quiet. We installed quite a few of these, and when your energy system kicks on, you don't hear it. And that's part of being comfortable inside a space. You know, when you, when you design, you don't always design for just energy or whatever. You want to design for comfort too. So you don't hear that rattling sound. And this doesn't require one of those air conditioning units outside, the condenser that has a fan blowing and making noise and, air pollu and noise pollution on everybody. I used to live, I rented in Norton Commons for a couple years and it was horrible. <laughs> I lived behind Gelato. And there was, there was uh, parking spots underneath our places where we live. You could hear all cars slamming the doors, trunks closing, people walking. You can hear the condensers going off in between the alleys. It's so uncomfortable. And why? Bad design or no design. This is the nutrition label for what we are putting in our bodies. We want to know. So you get an MSDS sheet, Material Safety Data Sheet, and required by OSHA to have them on job site. It says, you know, so if, it, if a fire occurs, the, the firemen are going to look at your MSDS sheet, see what's in there, in that building, so that they know what they're exposed to and what, what types of uh, risks there are. But not all MSDS tell you exactly what's in that product. We want material manufacturers to disclose 99 point whatever percent of what is in their product. Yeah, some of it might be privileged or whatever, or protected, but, you know, I don't want to use it if I don't know what you're giving me. And that's why what's interesting is that when, when Bullet Center, the one we showed you, the six-story building, was being put out there, 
uh, to bid, and, and they were looking for people that were qualified and cared about telling them what's in their products and, and was red list free. ProSoco has this wet flash. It's in Seattle, and they put it on the outside of the glass rock for St. Gervain product. This keeps out water. It's a weather barrier. It's an air barrier, and it's a vapor barrier. But they had phthalates in it. Phthalates, not, not quite a vapor barrier. Phthalates is, uh, it, it keeps, um, uh, it gives elasticity to the product. So um, phthalates has been tested and proven to affect men's reproductive system. And so the people that are making it inside the plant are, are exposed to it, and the people that are applying it, these guys here, even though they're smoking cigarettes, <laughs> they're, also, they're also exposed to that. So what happened was ProSoco said, man, we really want to be a part of your project. Let me get back to you in a couple of weeks. We'll, we'll, we want to talk to some people in our chem lab and all that. And they came back and said, give us three months. We're going to reformulate our formula. We want to do this, and we want to be on your project. So they took the phthalates out, and they were able to make their product safe for people to work and live with. Um, you want to think about embodied carbon footprint, and you know, um, what are we when we make a place? What are we, uh, you know, the effect? How much carbon is there going into producing this product and making better decisions on that product that we choose? Um, so part of the declare in, is creating responsibility in the industry. Um, there are some more areas around that, and a living economy, you know, trying to source locally uh, so it doesn't have to come from too far and supporting locally. Um, and, you know, here's kind of a little more parameters around that. And net positive waste, so we can treat all our waste. And, and you know, it's like a, it's a cycle. So we could treat, uh, my buddy right now, a colleague and buddy of mine, Robert Scarano, he's such a character, he's in Brooklyn, New York. I went and visited his project, it's called Bright and Green. Six units above, two units that are retail below, right in the middle of Brooklyn near uh, Brighton Beach. And it was an urban infill, just sidewalk space between the buildings. His place does all this, it's living building challenge, uh, living building certified. But the, all the toilets flush normally like they do with water, rainwater collected, and the solids go down with the water, there's a separator, it takes the water out to the side, it drops the solid into a little chamber, so like that round, and there's a quarter of it, and it's open to where it drops into just bark chips and worms. The bark chips and worms, they, they just do their do their job, and the worms make it into the best yeah. topsoil you could ever have. And what happens is, it's six units, there's quite a few people living there. After maybe five, six months, it might get full, or even longer. He just rotates it one quarter turn, Let's those worms keep doing their thing, puts more bark chips in the other chamber, puts a couple worms, and then when the other worms are done there, they just jump over to the other side and they keep doing their work. <laughs> it's very simple. Is that Brighton and Green, like Brighton Beach? Yes, yeah, it's right by Brighton Beach. And here's some more examples. I've been to the Birchie School, it's awesome. The kids in there actually had their input in design and they said, we want a river flowing through our classroom. <laughs> and the you know, kids come up with crazy ideas, but hey, these are wonderful ideas. And sure and lo and behold, I don't know if the picture is in the river is here, it's not, but there's, there's actually a river with pebble stone, it has glass over it, water comes off the roof and it goes right through the classroom on the floor, it's beautiful. Nice. Um, actually here, this is in Hawaii, they created this to, to, to maximize the use of nature. That's why you see these really cool designs. This is good design. It may look a little modern to some people, but if you don't create design that puts nature first and doesn't turn its back on nature, I'm going to talk to you like this? No. We want to be able to take nature because nature's there for free. This is using nature. This whole roof here with a lot of fog there creates condensation. It goes down in this thing and they, create, and they make their own water um, from all that fog. And then here it brings in all that natural light. So you know, it's a call to action. The living building challenge It's not easy. It's, it's, it takes some work for us. It takes pioneers. It takes people that care to, to, to make effective change. And, take some of their time to, to put it and make it reality and, and, and encourage other people to do so. What's easier to do, create a model and show it off to a community or lobby for changes in mm -hmm. ordinances and laws and yeah. whatever? It's, it's an excellent question because the Living Building Challenge is that model. Right. And when you do go through the Living Building Challenge, you have to lobby for <laughs> certain changes to be able to make it Living Building certified. 
So when you go through those challenges, you will come up to roadblocks of not being able to collect all your energy like Ted and, and Steve and Wilma Wana, Wana were telling me here in Indiana that they're trying to now only give you back a third of your money when you pr produce solar here in Indiana. So we want to try to, when we, when we run into those barriers, we want to be able to try to bring them down to be able to allow us to be truly independent of, of what uh, they're trying, trying to make us depend on. I'm sorry, we might have run a little bit. Is there any questions? I'm sorry. Question for you. Uh, in southern Indiana here, what kind of challenges would we run into if we wanted to construct a home and have a gray water system? Um, here. Collecting, collecting gray water for toilet flushing. Yeah. Like that. It's uh, illegal. It's illegal, Ted? Sure. Okay. Yeah. See, the, the, unless you are far enough out away from the urban areas that you're in rural farmland and stuff okay. like that. But any area that has a water system, you know, available, available mm -hmm. must connect must hook to, to it. it. And that's what we're trying to overcome. In, in Kentucky, believe it or not, when I was doing that, my Green Kentucky home, I was trying to find the right person to talk to in, in Frankfurt with the state plumbing to find out if I can use gray water. Excuse me. Um, and we were, by the time I had gotten far enough with all my rough in, I found out later that we are allowed to collect water and use the flush toilets in Kentucky. So, you know, that is, that's a big step compared to where other people are. But when you do the living building challenge, what you do is kind of like make your design, you turn it in for permit. <laughs> and so and that's where the questions will arise to see whether they'll let you do it or not. Right now, and I know in Kentucky, they allow us to just do rainwater to use the flush those toilets. Yeah. These things, to really be independent of, of really having to rely on anything, we, we have, it's illegal. And a, a really well-designed um, living is, is being in more in a dense populated area where you can, like I said, be able to walk or bike to where you need to go for everything, entertainment, work, education, but also uh, being able to source your food close by. And, you know, when you think about it, if, you're, if you as a community, say, scale jump and you all, you and like your neighborhood are able to cr produce all your energy and able to produce all your water and treat your own waste, if a natural disaster does occur and knocks out our local utility, our local water, we're not affected by that. You know, the tornado or uh, an earthquake or whatever happens that affects everything, it's going to knock out thousands, hundreds of thousands of places, like in New York and Sandy. I mean, it, it takes a, a it takes international and, uh, relief help to help places. And when you're on a community that's right-sized community, if something gets knocked out, maybe one or two houses might get knocked out, neighbors can help. We don't need the whole, you know, the army to intervene or, you know, the government or other people come from other places to intervene and help. Or what if there was a terrorist attack? They hit our infrastructure. Now our homes are out of, out of use. So it's, it's, it's basically kind of going back to simplicity. Nowadays, what is the real American dream? I mean, yeah. is the American dream to have a white picket fence and, you know, a big house and a car? Yeah, these are indicators of success to some people, but that's not really success, really. Is it or is it not? So, I mean, yeah, where are we going um, is less is more these days. And if you can have less with more value to it or less that you have to worry about, less to take care of, less to maintain, less to tie you down with, then you can have more experiences in life, travel more or spend money where it counts instead of to the coal industry or to the, you know, the gas industry or to the water industry or whatever, uh, you know, or your mortgage. And, and one point too is that uh, there, I, I'll tell you a trend that's going to happen. In 30 years, this, this is all going to keep coming and we're going to make this where it's normal. So when people do make decisions to buy something, we're not going to worry about what's in it because it's already going to take it and it's going to be normal. So people that don't think aren't going to have to think <laughs> anyways. But the trend of cars is going down. Bike sales will go up. Yeah. People buying their produce from Kroger or wherever is going to go down because it's going to go up. Over there, it's going to cost more for people to buy it because transportation costs, etc. And people are going to farm, do more things on their own because they want to be more natural, be able to support themselves.